Thanks, Dale, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, this is the final in our webinar series, and I just want to take a moment just before we begin just to thank everybody who's dialed in over the last eight weeks. It's been really great to have you all on board and to be able to take you through what really are a set of profound priorities for the next Australian government in relation to Australia's children and young people. Before we begin today's webinar, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land, of the lands on which we're meeting. Now, those lands are varied. There are people joining us from all around the country. Sam and I are today sitting in the uh, studio of Racy in our office in Canberra. Um, we are on the lands of the Ngunnawal people, and um, I want to pay my respects to their elders the past, their elders of the present, and to their elders who are emerging. And I want to acknowledge the continuing role that Indigenous people play in shaping the great place that Canberra is today. As I said, uh, today's speaker is Sam Page. Uh, Sam is the CEO of Early Childhood Australia, an organisation that's been advocating for young Australians for children since 1938. Sam has worked in a variety of positions across the community, public sector and as well as the private sector. She has a wealth of experience in advocating for the things that actually matter to young Australians and to their families. And we are delighted to have Sam come along today and to share her insights in this final pre-election webinar. So without further ado, over to you, Sam. Thank you very much, Penny. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and thanks to everyone who's joined us online um, or who might be watching this later at another time. The uh, Early Learning Everyone Benefits campaign has been running now for three years, so you may have already heard of it, um, but uh, it's my pleasure to give you a bit of an overview of that and to talk about how the major parties are lining up uh, on some of the priorities that we've identified under that campaign at this year's federal election. Uh, many of you do know Early Childhood Australia, the peak advocacy organisation uh, for children from birth to the age of eight, their families and the professionals that work in the field of early childhood education. Um, Penny mentioned we've been around since 1938. I haven't personally been around since 1938, um, but it is a, a um, wonderfully strong legacy of advocacy, um, largely driven by activist women uh, over that 80 odd years. Uh, ECA is proud to be the founding member of the Early Learning Everyone Benefits campaign uh, and I'm giving this uh, presentation as one of the spokespersons for the campaign. Before I share with you our analysis of early childhood policies um, related to this uh, federal election, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background um, on the campaign. Uh, so this is a partnership campaign. It's been very important from the beginning um, that this campaign isn't run by just one organisation or a small number of organisations with a particular interest in early learning. Uh, it's a very broadly based campaign. We have 27 organisations to date that are uh, a part of it. Our partners and supporters include PEAKS um, such as SNAKE, the Early Learning Association of Australia, Family Daycare Australia and Playgroup Australia, as well as research organisations including ERACI, the Centre for Community Child Health and the University of Wollongong, as well as service providers and community organisations with expertise in the delivery of early childhood services including Uniting Care, Brotherhood of St Lawrence, Good Start Early Learning, Gowrie Australia, KU, CNK, Explore and Develop and SDN. Uh, and of course, if you are uh, in an organisation that you think might be interested in being part of this campaign, we'd love to hear from you. That's my little pitch for today. Um, just to begin with a little bit of um, definition, early learning happens in the years from birth to the age of eight. Um, that's the definition of early childhood. Uh, the campaign is focused on the years before compulsory schooling, so from birth to five pretty much. Most children uh, transition to school at five or six, so we really focused on those years before children start school. We recognise the importance of the home learning environment as well as the role of uh, educational programs including playgroup, um, parent support and early childhood education and care. Early learning happens in all of those contexts. We have two overarching goals with the campaign, um, to increase public awareness and understanding of the benefits of investing in early learning for Australia's future prosperity. So hence um, the Everyone Benefits tag, uh, which is that there are social and economic benefits to be derived from increasing investment in early learning. Uh, and secondly, to increase access to quality programs that amplify children's development. And those programs might be programs that work with families at home or in the community or in early childhood education and care settings. Uh, the campaign has a national focus, so it's very much 
um, directed at a, a federal government and federal decision making. However, we know that the delivery of early childhood um, programs is uh, complicated across the country and that state and territory governments have a major role in this as well. Uh, so we do have materials that speak to that and we do look at uh, the performance of the early childhood education and care sector across jurisdictions. We had some specific recommendations around addressing um, educational disadvantage and reducing inequality. Uh, and for that reason, some specific um, ideas around increasing access to quality programs for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children uh, and a strong commitment to inclusion more generally in the early childhood um, sector. I want to address a potential concern straight off the bat um, that some have expressed about the Everyone Benefits campaign because it seems very focused on early education rather than the role of parents. Um, ECA and partners recognise that the home learning environment um, is very important um, and can make the most significant difference uh, to children's education over the long term. However, it can be quite a difficult environment to influence, uh, whereas um, providing children with access to quality programs, we can better control the quality of the early learning experiences in early childhood settings um, rather than in the home learning environment. But I don't, I don't want to get into a game of one or the other. I think what's really important is that we're all advocating for both. Um, and so part of the campaign, uh, we do recognise the importance of early development programs such as playgroups, um, the rhyme time programs that operate in libraries, um, and literacy support programs such as Let's Read and Hippie. Um, these are all really important programs as well. We're not in the business of choosing either or between playgroups and preschool, for example. We're going to argue that both of those are important. Um, we also believe in the importance of universally accessible, high quality early education that gives children the opportunity to um, learn through play in rich learning environments with other children of the same age. Um, that's particularly important, uh, we know from the research, for children from the age of three. Um, Fundamentally, uh, we, the Navy doesn't have to choose between buying submarines and warships. Um, the early learning sector shouldn't have to choose between playgroup and preschool or home learning programs such as Hippie and Let's Read and um, centre-based programs delivering preschool programs. I think we need to um, make the case and argue together for a continuum of approaches across the age range um, from um, pre-birth if we can, uh, right through to the transition to school um, and beyond. And I think that is reflected in the partners involved in this campaign. We have quite a diversity of partners. So just in terms of a little bit of history, the campaign was launched in May in 2016, so we're in our third year now. Um, it was launched just days before Malcolm Turnbull, um, the then Prime Minister, called the federal election in that year. Uh, and during that election campaign, we ran our first National Early Childhood um, Election Forum with representatives from the Coalition, Labor and the Greens, and that was held in Adelaide and live streamed nationally. Uh, during that election campaign, early childhood issues did not really feature, and we certainly didn't hear any of the major parties talking about the strategic importance of early childhood educators. So we do feel there's been a, a demonstrable shift since 2016 uh, in terms of the, the, the prominence of early childhood, early childhood um, development as well as early education in the current um, federal election campaign this year. Um, we had a little bit of fun in 2016 in October when we delivered boxes of fudge uh, across the federal parliament to all the senators and MPs. Um, at the time, it was a welcome gift to the 45th parliamentarians um, with the tagline, don't fudge early learning, and it had our campaign messages um, regarding one in five Australian children um, being uh, disadvantaged, but developmentally disadvantaged uh, at the point of transition to school and that being two in five Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. Um, the uh, security at Parliament House weren't too delighted with that particular <laughs> activist um, approach and uh, so I'm not sure that we'll be welcoming the next um, the 46th Parliament uh, with boxes of fudge. We might have to think of something a little less um, difficult for the security services to manage. But we got there and we did get our boxes of fudge around and they have been a talking point um, with MPs and senators since then. You may have seen our foundation research report, The State of Early Learning. We produced this for the first time in 2016. I have some show and tell. Um, these are the reports here. 
the reports are snapshots. They be, they pull together existing data. So the campaign is not in a financial position to commission um, research or new data, but they do pull together existing data, um, including the AEDC um, results, uh, information that we have from the, yes, the quality regulator, CEQA, um, as well as participation reports, both for preschool and um, uh, early childhood education and care, which includes long day care, family day care, and outside school hours services. Um, that's available through the report on government services that the Productivity Commission produces, as well as um, reports against the National Partnership Agreement on preschool access, for example. And so the idea is to pull all that data into one place and provide a um, starting point for the campaign in terms of what level of access children have to early childhood education and care in 2016. We repeated that exercise in 2017. Um, we didn't do it in 2018 because we didn't feel that there was sufficient new data available, but we are currently working on a new version of that report for 2019, and that will be out later this year, so probably the same sort of time frame around October. Um, and we'll then provide that report to all of the new MPs and senators um, in the federal parliament, and we also send it to ministers and departments around the country in um, relevant to education um, uh, portfolios. Uh, we're really pleased to have the Queensland University's Institute for Social Science Research working on the report um, this year. Uh, the Mitchell Institute um, provided pro bono support for the version in 2017, um, and it's great to have Queensland University involved this year. Uh, another highlight from the campaign was the Early Learning Matters Week we held for the first time last year in August in 2018. We invited early childhood services across Australia and in fact early childhood programs as well. So play groups um, and uh, child and family centres, uh, all, all, we had quite a diversity of different organisations and programs involved. Um, and we assisted them to invite federal MPs and senators to visit. Um, and so we had uh, 68 politicians visited 69 services and programs. Um, visits took place in every state um, and territory across the country, including six ministers, two assistant ministers, ministers and ten shadow ministers. And we considered that um, was a very successful level of engagement for the first time we had run that week. Um, we also were able to use that as an opportunity to invite uh, professionals working with young children to send through photos demonstrating rich learning experiences that children were participating in and we made those photos available on social media and that was an exercise in demonstrating that um, there is a, uh, a wonderful um, complexity and richness to the type of early learning um, programs being delivered in Australia that really deserves to be better recognised um, by our representatives in Parliament. There are some, here are some of the photos um, that were provided and we ran those um, on Facebook with the hashtag Early Learning Matters. I'm, I'm, um, you can see a selection of them still um, through Facebook or on the uh, campaign website. Uh, we are planning to run Early Learning Matters Week again this year, so if you'd like to get involved, it would be terrific to hear from you. You can jump onto the campaign website, which I'll flash up at the end, um, and volunteer your service or program um, to participate, and we'll help you um, with letters of invitation um, once the new parliament is formed. The campaign is largely an online campaign uh, run through social media. Uh, we don't um, have a lot of collateral, printed collateral uh, as such. Uh, we rely on social media to get the messages out and to share information with both um, early childhood professionals and with families with young children. So here are some of the social media type posts uh, that the campaign has produced, um, emphasising um, the level of developmental vulnerability that children are experiencing in Australia and particularly for average or Torres Strait Islander children. Um, that's a very key message of the campaign. I think our um, analysis suggests that generally the Australian public think Australia is doing pretty well, that Australian children are pretty advantaged, um, that we don't have a problem with our education performance, um, but the data tells a different story. And so we are trying to get that message out there uh, that there's quite a substantial number of children who are developmentally vulnerable at the time that they transition into school. Um, and we've also um, got a number of um, spokespersons for the campaign and quotes um, from leading, uh, from thought leaders and influencers around the country that we regularly um, 
promote through social media and these can be shared with families and shared with um, professionals, really reinforcing that idea that early learning is important. Uh, we have 15,000 followers for the campaign now on Facebook and about 1,000 Twitter followers, another 8,000 supporters on our email list that are receiving regular newsletters from the campaign. And anyone can get involved. So if, if you're interested in um, receiving the newsletter or following us on social media, please, um, you're very welcome to do that. Um, the messaging to politicians, um, we have worked really hard to um, develop some very crisp messages, some very clean messages. There are still quite a number of them. Um, it's, uh, it's difficult to run a campaign on early learning when you're talking early learning from um, birth to five across home, community and education settings. It's difficult to run um, with uh, just one or two campaign asks. So um, there are quite a number of campaign asks to cover off um, the, the different um, areas of priority that have been identified. We have managed, however, to um, get down to a two-page briefing paper. That was quite difficult early on in the campaign to get down to a two-page two briefer um, for MPs that basically um, run politicians through the rationale for the campaign. So the fact that we have too many children who are developmentally vulnerable when they're starting school, that this puts them at higher risk of experiencing reduced educational, behavioural and health and social outcomes throughout their school career but also well into adulthood uh, and that children who receive quality early learning um, support and experiences and programs before they start school are much more likely to succeed, make a tr successful transition into school, um, uh, continue with their schooling, uh, finish school and go on to tertiary or vocational training. They are also more likely to have improved mental and physical health. Early learning really can transform children's lives especially children who are vulnerable or have experienced um, disadvantage in the early years. Um, we draw on uh, a number of reputable research um, studies uh, to um, support that messaging to politicians. Uh, many of you will have seen the Heckman curve that's um, on the screen on the right which uh, demonstrates from an economic point of view that more investment in the early years uh, pays higher dividends later on than um, waiting and investing in the later years of school. Uh, here in Australia, the AEDC data shows us that children who have attended early childhood education before they start school have half the level of vulnerability of children who had no early childhood education experience. And so that's a, a key um, piece of evidence that we draw on regularly. There are a number of reports um, that this, this data is um, included in or summarised very well. Um, that uh, Lifting Our Game report by Susan Pascoe and Deb Brennan is the most recent one, that's the one on the right, was um, released in 2018 after an extensive review of literature and a national consultation process. Uh, and that report really reinforces the evidence for two years of preschool and address the um, barriers that many children experience, um, particularly those children that are the highest risk of educational disadvantage. The report also raised the need for a workforce strategy and for further investment in the quality of early education programs. Um, prior to lifting our game, uh, the Mitchell Institute in 2016 released a report called Two Years Are Better Than One, and that's particularly focused on the rationale for extending universal preschool for another two years before school. So at the moment in Australia, we fund one year of universal preschool for mostly children who are four years old in the year before they go to compulsory schooling. Um, but the evidence suggests um, that we should extend that to two years. So children start at three and have two years of preschool programs before they start school. School. And that is um, pretty standard in Europe and most OECD countries, New Zealand, Canada, UK, um, they are all um, investing in three-year-old preschool programs as well as the four-year-old preschool programs. Australia is very behind um, in that area of policy. Um, there has been um, quite a healthy debate about whether three-year-old preschool should be targeted to vulnerable and disadvantaged children rather than delivered as a universal platform for everybody. Um, the evidence that we have reviewed um, internationally and from Australia suggests that it's quite difficult to deliver targeted programs to three-year-olds. Um, 
children at, you have to identify children when they're two um, and while many of them are in disadvantaged communities they're not by any means all in disadvantaged communities in fact less than half and so targeting programs is quite complicated um, for very young children and what we see in the international evidence particularly from Canada for example is that universal programs are perhaps better placed to draw um, disadvantaged and vulnerable children into the service system. Um, at, when, when services are freely available, available everywhere, you have a right to access them, um, you get a much greater level of um, participation amongst those vulnerable families. And then we can do a proportionate universal response and we can provide more hours to the children that are at risk. Um, that seems to be the most sensible way to increase um, the participation rates of very vulnerable children in quality early learning. Um, and prior to the two years of Better Than One report, the um, PricewaterhouseCoopers paper, putting a value on early childhood education and care, um, really established the economic case for investing in early education, arguing that there's an estimated $29 billion return to the Australian economy um, if we invest properly in the early years. Um, and the, the um, return comes from uh, three areas. One is women's workforce participation, which is a bit of a no-brainer in early childhood education and care, that if you invest in good quality programs, um, women feel uh, more, they're more able and more, more um, confident um, to return to work and leave their children in quality programs. So there's an immediate um, benefit to the economy by increasing women's workforce participation. The second area of benefit is in children's long-term educational um, outcomes, uh, so it enhances the uh, outcomes that, that the education system more broadly can deliver um, by reducing the number of children that are starting school developmentally behind their peers. And thirdly, is the um, is, there's a very large economic return based on reducing inequality and the long-term impacts of inequality in terms of children's individual outcomes. So those are the three areas um, of economic return. So that's the background for the campaign. The 2019 election priorities, we have seven. We did try to reduce that to five. But, you know, this is a partnership campaign. Um, and as I said earlier, we don't want to get into a bidding war either between um, different priorities. So these are the seven um, that we came up with. The first is that we need to develop an early years strategy. We are very conscious that early childhood development cuts across multiple portfolios. Um, you have the education portfolio, obviously. Also, the health portfolio is very important. The social services portfolio is where we have family and children's centres, play groups, and other um, support provided to, to parents of young children. Um, then we have things like library programs that might be funded under arts or um, central agencies um, or funded from a variety of different sources. So, um, community-based programs, for example. So uh, our ECA and our campaign partners felt very strongly that it was time for an overarching early years strategy that works across the portfolios and across the different levels of government, so across federal, state and local government. Um, it's ambitious, it's a big ask, um, but it's really important. Um, Australia does have an early um, childhood development strategy, but it's a bit dated. It was a COAG initiative. It's a bit dated now and it's rarely ever referred to um, and it really focused on um, the delivery of educational programs. So this is a bit broader um, and would be a major refresh of our higher level principles um, for early childhood development. Uh, the second election priority is to give all children access to two days of early education a week. Um, and that is basically from the end of paid parental leave to the transition to school. Um, it's beyond extending the preschool education platform for two years. It's, this is actually about giving all children access. It doesn't mean that families have to take that up. It means it's there if they want it and we can guarantee the quality of programs and we can guarantee access to a program if families want it. It gives children a right of access as opposed to the current system where we have an activity test where access to early education is predicated on the family's workforce participation. Our argument is that children should have two days in their own right. If you want to put an activity test on additional hours, additional days per week, that's fine. That would make sense from a you know, um, social policy perspective, but children should have two days in their own right. Um, that would give them stability of access regardless of fluctuating workforce um, participation um, for their parents. 
Um, the other thing that also does, we've argued with government, is give um, households more stability. So rather than you meet the activity test one fortnight but not the next fortnight or you've got to constantly re-evaluate what your income is going to be to try and um, work out where you are on the childcare subsidy, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, two days of access would be simple to communicate to families, easy for families to understand. They would know that they've got that, they can rely on that, um, and it supports them then to... Um, navigate complexities in the workforce. Um, we know that a lot of women returning to work after having a baby are in casualised jobs, they're, in, they're on short-term contracts, their workforce participation fluctuates a lot in that first year or two and so having a stability of two days a week um, would uh, work for them we believe and would actually support the, the government's um, objectives in terms of workforce participation while at the same time giving children an educational right. So that works for everybody. It's quite deliberately two days a week. Some people who are familiar with the research in this area will argue, well, it should be shorter day, shorter hours spread across three or four days. That would give a better benefit to children. And we accept that that's true, but politically that's hard to... Um, hard to argue for. Um, the way services are currently structured and the way the subsidy system currently works, um, it's much more complicated to argue for that. So we've gone with two days because that's simple, everyone can understand it. Um, and it's also very clear that we're not just trying to put bums on seats and fill up services here. You know, this two days a week is, is a reasonable um, rationed amount um, to provide to families uh, underneath any activity test that might apply. Uh, the third election priority is to permanently fund universal access to early education. So that's preschool, universal access to preschool. Um, and where possible, we would like to um, uh, see that address access and participation barriers. So we know that in rural and remote communities, there are a lack of preschool programs for children to attend. We know in some states and territories, the cost of uh, participating is too high. We know that in other places, we have a workforce um, shortage. We really need to lock the, the funding in um, permanently in order to get a better system happening across the country. At the moment, universal access to preschool is funded on a 12-month basis in the federal budget doesn't really allow for services or state and territory governments to do any long-term planning. The fourth election priority is to give all children at least two years of early education. So we're saying two days and then we're saying two years. I know this seems a bit confusing but this is about um, with the younger children from birth to three, that's about them having access if they want it. But from the age of three, we know that that will definitely benefit children and we should be aiming for really high levels of participation. So the three and four year olds should get that two years of early education and we should be actively promoting that to parents and actively um, encouraging families to attend. Um, really in, in other OECD countries, um, they're looking at well over 97% participation rates for three and four year olds. Um, in Australia, we are way behind um, with only about um, 60 to 70% of participation amongst three year olds. Um, the fifth election priority is to make sure that First Nations children and children um, in remote areas get appropriate high quality early education. And we're not naive about that. We know that there's a lot that needs to happen in order to do that. Um, and we've recently done some policy work with SNAKE, the early childhood peak um, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, around how you would do that and how you would deliver those services through Aboriginal owned and operated um, services as much as possible. Um, and uh, acknowledging that many families are um, anxious about using mainstream programs and much more likely to send children to Aboriginal owned and operated services and so we have had um, we've, we've had a good look at the research in that area and come up with some much more specific policy recommendations around that. Um, the sixth election priority is to fund the national quality framework appropriately. This um, was a bit of a shock to us in the budget last year that the federal government pulled um, a, a stack of money out of the national quality framework, leaving states and territories um, under-resourced to properly implement the national quality framework. And the reality is we cannot deliver better educational outcomes for young children if we can't guarantee the quality of the services that they're attending. Um, so we would like to have the money put back into the national quality framework. It's not a large amount of money, but it's an important um, 
priority. And the last one is to fund workforce development um, in the early childhood sector. Uh, we know that the single biggest impact on the quality of provision of programs is the uh, relationship with a competent um, educator and the child. Uh, and so unless we can make sure that we have properly qualified, competent um, educators and teachers working in services and stabilise the um, workforce so that they can form good relationships with children and respond to children's individual needs um, and interests, um, we can't deliver uh, quality programs. And at the moment we have um, workforce shortages across teachers, educators, diploma and certificate qualified, um, as well as in other areas of family and, and child um, support programs. We have workforce shortages, we know that. Um, in the early childhood education and care sector, we have ridiculous level of turnover, 37% per annum um, of qualified educators and teachers leaving the sector um, because of the inequity of wage rates with the broader education system and even with retail and hospitality. Many educators tell us that they leave to work in Bunnings because they can earn more um, there than they can working in early childhood education, which is simply not okay. Um, we need a workforce development um, strategy. Um, so we have we have run a, a candidate survey. Uh, so we have sent this survey to every registered candidate standing in the federal election for the House of Representatives and or the Senate. Um, we've asked them to fill in the survey individually, um, which asks them where they stand on each of the seven priorities that I just um, spoke to in the previous slide. Uh, the response rates are um, pretty interesting. Uh, I think there's, I don't have the number here, but I think it's over 360 um, candidates uh, standing. A third of all the Greens, the Australian Greens candidates that we sent the survey to have filled it out, so 33%. About a quarter of the um, Australian Labor Party candidates that we sent the survey to have filled it out, it's about 24%. Um, only one coalition candidate um, has completed the survey to date, although we have now received a formal response from the campaign headquarters um, outlining their official position on the seven election priorities, so um, that's that's good. Um, our report on the survey responses is about to come out. Um, it'll be tomorrow or Friday. Um, that will be that report will be available. Uh, we also last Thursday uh, we had a national early childhood policy forum um, with the main spokespersons from each of the major parties, um, the Honourable Amanda Rishworth, the Shadow Minister for Early Childhood Education and Development. Um, Senator James Patterson, who was representing Education Minister Dan Tehan um, from the Coalition Government, and Senator Janet Rice, representing Greens Early Childhood Spokesperson, Senator Maureen Faruqi. Uh, we also had um, a, a local independent candidate, um, Ruby O'Rourke, who um, had, a, had a few moments to outline her rationale for her um, uh, campaign. You can watch the forum in full by going to our Facebook page um, or our homepage, uh, everyonebenefits.org, where you'll find the video to the recording of the whole forum. The, the three spokespersons all spoke to their um, party policies um, and each other's, um, and we we began the evening with a present with a with a short um, speech from. Geraldine Atkinson, who's the Vice Chairperson of SNAKE, on the um, reasons why Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children should be front and centre in this federal election campaign um, and the, um, the extent of uh, educational disadvantage that those children are at risk of experiencing. Um, moving on to how the parties compare. We have detailed policy positions from Labor and from the Greens. Um, the Liberal National Coalition are yet to release a detailed um, policy position. However, they have responded now officially to our survey, so we can speak um, a little bit to that. We also did have um, spokespersons write for our um, national newsletter, The Voice, um, so we can glean a little bit from that. I'm going to run through the seven election priorities and where the parties stand. So in terms of a national early years strategy, um, Liberal National Party have said um, no, they see no need for that. Then they have no commitment to that um, at this at this point in time. Um, both Labor and the Greens have agreed that that um, should be a priority and committed to developing a national early years strategy in the next term of parliament um, if they are able to form government. 
the early year strategy would encompass early childhood development, family support, play-based early learning across home, community and early childhood settings. Um, a quote from Amanda Richworth is that Labor recognises current programs and funding for early childhood development is spread across a number of departments and if elected they will work to improve policy coordination and evaluation across governments. Um, there have also been some other um, funding announcements that are relevant to this election priority. Uh, we asked candidates whether they support building families understanding about children's development in the early years. Um, and Labor announced a policy to invest $1.6 million to upgrade and expand community toy libraries and playgroups, um, noting that this is the first time federal funding has been provided to toy libraries. Um, the Greens said that they support comprehensive strategy and recognise the importance um, of early learning across settings uh, and um, also spoke to allocating a proportion of the community childcare fund, which is part of the um, childcare subsidy um, system, that they would quarantine that and allocate that to quality, community controlled, culturally safe, integrated early year services, say that quickly, um, to ensure access in areas of high First Nations populations and high levels of disadvantage. So going some way towards the recommendation in our policy paper with SNAKE around um, re-establishing funding for community owned and operated um, services where that's possible. The second um, priority area, two days a week of access to early learning. Um, Liberal National Parties are standing by the reforms that they've made to the childcare subsidy. So uh, the new childcare subsidy came into effect in um, July last year. It replaced um, the basket case that was the childcare benefit and the childcare rebate that nobody could understand um, with one childcare subsidy, but one childcare subsidy that is almost as complicated as those two previous payments together because it has um, a three-step activity test and it has means chest um, as well and then it has additional um, subsidy payments for uh, vulnerable families and children such as those experiencing financial hardship as well as additional funding for um, services operating in difficult markets um, through the community childcare fund. So it is still quite complicated um, but it is better than the system we had before of two separate payments. Uh, they are arguing that, that there is um, demonstrable evidence that that has improved affordability to families um, and um, increased access among certain cohorts of um, households. Uh, to um, accessing quality early learning and so we've given them two stars for that. Um, that is true. Uh, the issue that we have with the current childcare system, childcare subsidy system is that the activity test complicates it um, and um, is there are, this, this is contentious. Um, we believe that the participation of vulnerable children, children at risk of educational disadvantage, has reduced under the new activity test. Um, government is arguing that's not the, that they have data that um, refutes that. Uh, however, we're very early in the new system and the data isn't um, readily available for everyone to interrogate. Um, so I think we just have to say it's, it, at the moment it's contentious. Uh, we do think that the um, new system is very confusing and both um, uh, the department and the government have acknowledged there are problems with the way the additional childcare subsidy system is working, which is for the most at-risk um, children. Uh, the Labor Party get three stars um, for their position. They are keeping the activity test for now and keeping the childcare subsidy system as it's designed, um, which is a change in this um, election positioning because previously they had talked about scrapping the childcare subsidy system that the Liberal um, government introduced, uh, but they are saying now they'll stick with it. Um, however, they will review the impact of the activity test on vulnerable children and families. Um, and they will also... Uh, remove the activity test for three-year-old children. So at the moment there's an exemption on the activity test for four-year-old children so that they can access uh, effectively a preschool program in a long daycare setting in the um, year, year that they are four. Uh, Labor are going to extend that um, to three-year-old children as well. Uh, and they're also um, promising a substantial increased investment um, to cover up to 100% of the benchmark fee uh, for early education for families that earn up to 69,000 approximately per annum and meet the activity test. So there's, they're, they're essentially making um, early education more affordable. In fact, um, it could potentially be free in some services um, 
for those low income families, which is a, a good thing. Um, the Australian Greens take it one step further, which is why they get five stars on this particular election priority. Um, they're going to abolish the activity test for all families and they propose fee free childcare for 80% of Australian families, including all families on household incomes under 171,000 per annum. Um, and subsidies then to households earning up to 351,000 um, per annum, which is really significant. I mean, that is essentially um, making early childhood education free or very affordable for um, by far the majority, you know, 95% probably of families with young children, which is a significant commitment. Um, and so we have to give that um, five stars. One of the arguments around um, subsidy access is around the high income families um, and the issue in high income families is that even if the household income is quite high, often one parent's income is not that high and so if they have no subsidy, the, rash, the, the um, logic of returning to work becomes a negative logic. It's not our fight, really, as early childhood advocates, um, but it, it is something that the party should pay attention to in their economic analysis. I'm conscious that I've been going a bit slow. I need to speed up a bit. Um, the third priority, two years of preschool and kindergarten, you can see there, the coalition have committed to maintaining the 15 hours a week for all four-year-old children, um, but they're saying they're not going to look at extending that into, to three-year-olds until they've got the participation rates amongst four-year-old um, targets met. Um, and, um, I, you know, we, we, could, we could spend a bit of time talking about that, but we better keep moving. Um, Labor has promised to fund universal access to 15 hours um, and extend that to the two years for the three and four year olds and that was announced early in the election campaign in October last year and at the cost of $1.75 billion over four years. Um, the Greens universal access um, for 24 hours, so not 15, up to 24 hours per week of early childhood education um, ups the ante again. They've both got five stars there because technically on the preschool kindergarten programs um, they're both delivering what we asked for, but the Greens are delivering more hours. Uh, funding certainty for preschool and kindergarten, again, um, the Coalition are really sticking with the one year time frame. Their argument for that is that they need to be able to negotiate with states and territories to support a longer term plans. They are committed to a longer term funding framework um, for preschool, but they need time to negotiate that with the states and territories. Um, the Labor government have said they will lock that funding in um, and end the funding uncertainty for preschool um, and kindergarten programs. So they're committing to permanent funding for universal access for three and four year olds. Um, the Greens have also supported locking in permanent funding under the National Partnership Agreement on Early Childhood Education. On addressing disadvantage for Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander or First Nations um, families and rural and remote children and families, we know they're not the same thing. They're two distinct groups that overlap, um, but uh, where they've been combined in this um, election priority. Um, this is perhaps the most important priority that we've got, uh, addressing the needs of children currently accessing the least um, amount of quality early learning programs but would stand to benefit the most. Uh, nobody gets five stars on this one. Um, uh, we have looked at SNAKE's eight election priorities as well as our own um, and we're feeling like um, we want to write a note home to all the leaders to say they could do better in this area. Um, the Coalition gets three stars because in this year's budget they had a $4.9 million um, allocation to an initiative to increase participation rates and set aside extra funding to support vulnerable and at-risk children through the, through the additional childcare subsidy. Uh, and so they are acknowledging that they need to do more in terms of addressing disadvantage. Um, Labor gets three stars because they have promised to review the impact of the childcare subsidy um, system and to look at the additional childcare subsidy system and how it's working or what's not working about it. Um, so they are getting three stars as well. Um, the Greens get four stars because they're talking more specifically about allocating a proportion of the ch community childcare fund for quality, community controlled and culturally safe and integrated early years services. Um, the funding quality, so this is restoring funding to the National Quality Framework, both Labor and the Greens have agreed to um, restore that, um, Liberal and National Party have said no, um, they are sticking by their decision to reduce um, investment in that area. 
uh, and then on a sustainable and quality early childhood workforce strategy. Um, we've had no response from the coalition on that. Um, they do acknowledge that there's a workforce problem but um, are not inclined to have government intervention. Um, Labor, uh, many of you will have seen it got a lot big run in the media um, last week have promised a substantial 20% pay increase over eight years for all early childhood educators and teachers um, and allocated a $100 million fund for workforce development and supported expanded capacity, including 10,000 free fee-free places in early childhood education courses at TAFE. Um, so they have they've really thought about their workforce strategy and committed quite a substantial amount of money to that. Um, and that would go a long way to addressing the pay equity issues um, and to uh, reducing the, the rate of turnover that we have. Um, the Greens, Australian Greens have also said that they recognise um, the significant contribution early childhood educators make to lifelong learning and have committed to supporting the United Voice Big Steps campaign, which is for fair pay. And I haven't said quite how they would deliver that, whether they were relying on the Fair Work Commission um, process or whether they would have another approach to that. I've also said they'll develop and implement a workforce strategy um, with the sector and make TAFE and university free for, the, for everyone so those studying to be early childhood educators and teachers um, would not end up with hex debts um, they need to pay off. Um, and they are more broadly committed to addressing the gender pay gap through legislative workplace and economic reforms. So there we go. That's the major parties on the seven election priorities um, of the campaign. Um, if you'd like to get involved in the campaign, um, you can do that. There's a dedicated campaign website that you can visit that I've just flashed up there. Just type Everyone Benefits into your favourite search engine and it will take you there. Um, nobody else has pinched the name yet, although I did notice Bill Shorten used it in his election um, speech, right, that strong, a strong economy everyone benefits or something like that. I wasn't sure whether that was our, whether we could claim an influence there or not. Um, one of the things um, we really love you to do is to um, help keep the pressure on the candidates uh, over the next few days until the election. Uh, you can contact your local candidates on our Get Involved page with links to their email addresses and templates, particularly in, in priority electorates, um, marginal seats essentially. Um, and uh, and um, encourage other people to get involved in the same way. Um, you can also, if you want to get involved um, through photos and posters, um, you can do that. Um, please use the hashtag Early Learning Matters um, and tag your local candidates um, as you just anything really that raises the importance of early education and puts it at, keeps it on the agenda um, will help. Um, you can also share the content that we've produced for social media. You can find that on our Facebook page um, or use the Twitter handle. Um, all the links to all of that are on the uh, Everyone Benefits website. There we go. I think that's everything. There are all the um, links and hashtags that you might want to use. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I haven't left a lot of time for questions, but I'm happy to take any. Thanks, Sam. That's fabulous. I, my neck sore. I found myself nodding in furious agreement with you so much during that that um, I've given myself a, a sore neck. Um, I'm not quite sure if we've got any questions that have come in. One question that's come in, Paul, can I get you to read that one out for us? Yeah, we'll just explain it. So we've just had the one question from Jody. Thank you, Jody. Sam, is there a difference in the research for outcomes for kids attending preschool programs at early childhood education and care services? versus attached to a primary school. I'm interested in whether the focus on child-led learning and play-based in ECEC services is equal or better to primary school attached preschools. ECEC based seems easier to implement for governments and parents, assuming no financial barrier. It's a very good question. It's quite complicated to, um, to answer it. Um, so what we know from the research is that quality preschool can happen in early education settings such as long daycare settings and um, preschool kinders associated with primary schools and preschool kinders that are standalone community-based um, services. It can happen in all of those settings. The key ingredients are that you have a qualified early childhood teacher who is delivering the program, not just designing the program, delivering the program, that you have an appropriate play-based environment in which to deliver the program, and that's sometimes the problem in school settings. They might have the teacher, but they don't have the environment. Um, so you have to have the teacher, you have to have the environment, 
um, and you have to have adequate levels of participation. So children have to attend um, for at least 15 hours a week in order to benefit um, from those programs. So um, the simple answer is that the quality can be just as good in any setting, but what we need to make sure those ingredients are all present. Um, and then we don't think that the National Quality Framework on its own gets us there um, for early childhood education and care. So in some jurisdictions such as Queensland, for example, early childhood education services need to meet the National Quality Framework, but they in addition to that, they need to say that they need to meet additional requirements to be an approved kindergarten provider. So um, that's quite a good model for ensuring that the quality that's delivered um, in long daycare settings is, is the same as um, the quality of programs that might be delivered in other settings. But that's not universal across all the states and territories. So we do have eight different systems, um, which gets a little tricky. I just wanted to add a question, I guess, on the on the NQF stuff, Sam, mm. if I could. I've, you know, out and about as I've been over the last few months, I've heard a lot of people saying it's time that the NQF had a bit of an upgrade, had a bit of a review how we're going. How are we going to do that if the if the funding's been cut? Are we able to do that? And um, we can still do that, and there is a review scheduled. So there's a there's a time frame um, for regular review, which is um, not. Uh, not hasn't changed. Uh, the funding that's been reduced is the funding that goes to the state and territory regulators to do the assessment and rating um, work. Uh, so it doesn't impact on the broader quality framework or the work of the national regulator or CEQA. Um, they, are, they still have their funding intact and they're still getting on with their job. Um, but the state and territory regulators have lost um, Commonwealth funding for doing rating assessment video, um, visits, which of course are critical to making sure that we are assessing quality regularly. So um, it shouldn't take three or four years to go back to a service. Um, we should be able to maintain a frequency of visits um, and that's what's been impacted by the reduction in federal government funding. Thanks. I think we've had one more question come in. Yeah, I think we've got time for this one, one, one last question. Sam, you mentioned that it is contentious whether participation of vulnerable children in early education has increased or decreased since the childcare subsidy reforms, and ECA thinks that it has decreased. Can you share what the competing data sources might be? Yeah, so there's um, so a number of large providers have have produced have pulled their data and produced a policy paper to government that does suggest there's been a decrease in the um, participation of vulnerable children, uh, and we're also hearing from Aboriginal um, services and formerly funded under the budget based funding program. Um, uh, I don't want to be jargonistic about it, but those services are telling us they've had a reduction in um, the participation of children in um, Aboriginal communities and rural and remote settings. Um, but the official data from the childcare subsidy system isn't, um, it, it's, it's still early days for that system. And uh, there is, what's potentially happening is that children, vulnerable children from one group has increased and vulnerable children from another group has decreased and so in the overall data it looks about the same. But actually there's been a shift in the population or where those children are coming from. So um, it's it's really that, that, yes, there are competing data sources and it's going to take a little while um, to work through that. But it's the voice of the providers really that are telling us that those families are um, have withdrawn children or reduced their hours um, or disappeared. Thanks so much. Um, we are just about out of time. So thank you so much, Sam Page. It's been delightful to have you come in and to share your insights over this very important and, and quite complex issue with us. We've, we really appreciate that. Um, I just want to take a moment now at the end of what has been a, a really busy eight weeks for um, us at Eracy. We've run um, an election webinar now, um, seven out of the last eight weeks. and. I'm delighted with the response we've had from, from you, our subscribers. Um, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for giving us your time. We know that um, a number of people have been going back over and looking at these webinars after we've put them online and we would encourage you to continue to share them. I also wanted to take a moment to thank my team. I want to thank Paul Hinderman, Dale Cook and Narelle Barry from Eracy who have pulled this work together, who have uh, provided um, excellent technical support for all of our speakers and have really put on on what is, um, I think, a, a major contribution to this debate. So thank you for your uh, contribution team. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing what happens uh, next Saturday. Um, thanks very much. Thank you.